In this lecture, I want to pick up on uh, uh, my discussion of uh, the genealogy on the genealogy of morals by Nietzsche, and uh, return to our argument concerning the value of our values, the origins of our ethical judgments, and so on, and look at the question of, as I've stated it in the opening lecture, the paradoxical situation that our morality may, oddly enough, have an immoral origin. And so this is the, uh, the argument to which we'll return. One of the points I didn't make about the genealogical method in the last lecture I want to make now, it's very important. Uh, when we look genealogically at the Greeks as a type, or Christians and Christianity, Nietzsche uses a kind of typology where we don't look for who speaks in a document, but for, as it were, what motivates the speaker behind the document. So the hermeneutic question of who's the speaker and is he honest isn't really what Nietzsche wants, but to see what kind of type would say something like that. See, the standard philosophical approach to a text would be to look at the propositions and then to determine if the argument is valid, sound, and then if the speaker is sincere, and so on. Nietzsche, rather than looking at that, looks at the question, what kind of person would make an argument like that? What type of person would evaluate like that, rather than to look at the evaluation? That's another way to look at genealogy. You know, rather than to look directly at the evaluation, you look at the kind, characteristic, or type that would make it. So when I make a remark about master morality, it's about a certain type that speaks in these various evaluatory words. Or about Christian morality, it's about the type, or what human type speaks in these texts. Okay? And again, that's part of the suspicion of the method, of what it causes us to suspect. Well, we get on to some rather uh, strong claims. The account of, as I say, of Greek ideals is that they are active, noble. You notice these various valorizing terms, but also they are somewhat childlike and naive. These are, these are terms that imply that there should be more sort of, of a mendacious spirit in human beings. More malice wouldn't be bad here. In fact, throughout the, t the text of Nietzsche, there's something like, and I don't want to trivialize it, but there's something like what Mick Jagger calls sympathy for the devil. That all really dialectical and intelligent human beings will have a sense for evil and some sympathy for the devil. Or they will be just a little stifled and boring. And I think that's not wrong. Just a little sympathy for the devil won't hurt. In any case, uh, let me look at a famous uh, argument, if I can hear this. Uh, in the uh, in the first type that we've looked at, the Greek type, we will we will give it a name. We'll call it the active type, or the master morality. And here we have what I've called active force, which re which prevails over reactive forces. And reactive forces here would be things that stand in the way of the will realizing what it wants. Okay. Well. That's not much of a problem from that position in Greek society where myths, and by the way, we are in the realm of myth here. These types are, after all, not really sociological accounts, but in a certain sense, myth mythic accounts. In a certain, if you put enough weight on myth, and I, I want to put a, a heavy weight on, on that term. But anyway, this is the, this is the active type. Uh, one of the faculties that the active type is noted for is the ability to forget. And this is again part of Nietzsche's ongoing polemic with what might be called mere historicism. People who just wander idly through the relics of the past in search of a cultural treasure or whatever. In other words, for Nietzsche, the active person is willing to forget. And he contrasts that with memory, which you need in Christianity in order for, even, for the redemption story, for example, to make sense. You need to remember the sufferings of the martyrs. Remember. The memory plays an entirely different role for the master morality, the way Nietzsche puts it, puts it they're strong enough to forget. So if insulted and you hit a, the master in the face, 
he hits you back, and that way he honors you, and then he forgets it, see? Because, first of all, if he turns the other cheek, he shames you by saying, well, you're not, you know, good enough to even fight with me. Rather, you hit him, he hits you back, and you both forget it. It's the West Texas version of master morality. He hits you, you hit him, and then you've treated each other with dignity, you forget it, and, and then you forget it. But you don't turn the other cheek and then remember it. Mendaciously remember it. Ah, yes, you hurt me now, but later. There's the secret that will come in with Christianity, the but later. Now, I want to make this, uh, I'll start with the typology, and then to, to read a brief portion of the genealogy where Nietzsche thinks he's uncovered, as it were, a text that's at the very heart of Christian morality for Nietzsche in this typological sense. Uh, the Christian type, Nietzsche says, is reactive. He calls it a slave morality. And in this type of morality, reactive forces prevail over the active ones. And here, you want things, but there is, as it were, principles and rules that stand between your will and fulfilling the will or the desire. And the extremes that we know throughout history that this is achieved are unbelievable, but their achievement has always had some perverse opposite character. And I'll try to use just one example here. And that's the monk who is going to think about the pleasures of the flesh no more. So the monk sleeps naked under a cloth that's rough, and as he denies that part of being human, of being a biological animal, as he denies it, does his body become less or more eroticized, I wonder? After years of sleeping under this rough blanket na naked and denying the flesh, oddly enough, what comes in precisely is a new, sublime, an elevated form of the erotic. Everything is eroticized about the blanket and the body of the, of the monk. No longer this straightforward sort of Greek physical act, but now an entire eroticized body. I mean, try to explain that the Victorian era produces novels like Wuthering Heights. I mean, the point is this, you know, the, the denial of that power in reactive power doesn't mean that people really just say no and things become de-eroticized. No, Christianity perversely eroticizes the world in a brand new way. And you know, in Wuthering Heights, I mean, the moment that you sin was the moment of sort of that Nietzsche thought was interesting about Christianity was that to break through and to sin gave a whole new dimension for him to human interest. It made the human being a more interesting species, sin did. Before that, we looked a lot like primates doing that, you know? And afterwards, it becomes this act filled with meaning across the whole terrain, subtle glances. Of course, all this may be gone now, right? It's just stuff you meet in the mall, same old thing as the Greeks, maybe. Who the hell knows? Or less. But anyway, during the Victorian era, you can imagine, you know, that a glance, a touch, a glove, you know, you read Kierkegaard on The Diary of a Seducer, and even though it's, all the book is about him just thinking about it, and not even mentioning anything, it's the least bit pornographic, it's just, my God, you can't get that involved over one look, can you? And yes, you can. But perversely, it was this morality that, as it were, pushed those active release of those normal human powers into this reactive mode so that they had to be worked out in devious and roundabout ways that did not de-eroticize humans, but eroticized us in a new way. And then, of course, made us had to lie about it. And, had, and then to take the lies inward in the form of guilt, where, oddly enough, the weak revenge themselves upon the strong, again, just in, in Nietzsche's terminology, this way. You know, you are, for example, under the master morality, you want something, but you really are just not up to getting it. So in the Greek scheme, you just don't get it because, and for, the simple reason you weren't up to it. You couldn't handle it. You couldn't do it. Now, the Christian will take that same inability and turn it against the active type and use it as a reproach. But the things they can't do, their limitations, become virtues. Now they're virtuous because 
their limitations, their faults, their inabilities to get the things they want now are valued highly. Whereas the active type, who previously was valued highly, who goes ahead and acts out, is considered immoral and, even worse, turns the punishment inward in the form of guilt because the morality is general. So he goes, I did what I wanted. Oh, I feel awful about it. And Nietzsche finds that mendacious and perverse. I did what I wanted to do. God, I feel terrible. I did what I was inclined to do. Oh, I feel awful. Well, see, for, see, for the Greeks, that, uh, the way that, that Nietzsche presents them, that's unthinkable. You can't imagine Odysseus later going, Oh, God, I blinded a God. I feel terrible. No, he's not blind. His eye knocked it out. Wow. Let me tell you a story about it. But no, uh, that would be too straightforward for what happens after Christianity, where reactive powers make the world a more subtle place, more erotic. In fact, open up whole new fields of interpretation. In fact, it's interesting to note that the first thing that the devil does in the Bible is to teach Eve to interpret. God's given a rather straightforward command. And Milton makes a lot out of this. God said, don't, don't eat anything off that tree. It's a myth. You all know this is a myth, so chill out. Uh, don't eat anything off that tree. Well, what does the serpent say? He says, well, Maybe God's testing you. Maybe God really wants you to eat it to prove that you're a worthy creature. So he starts thinking, well, well maybe that's it after all. Let, Let me think, think and interpret, and interpret this. this. And so it's with the devil that interpretation is born within the inside of the text of the Bible itself. The devil says, interpret. Think, interpret. Well, don't just listen to that. I mean, of course, that can mean more than one thing. Well, of course, so, so could everything, everything else. else. Anyway, now, uh, the Christian morality then, uh, when, it, when Nietzsche says it turns itself against life, there's one level in which I want you to understand this where I think it's just pretty obvious. Sort of flat-footed critique. Uh, at least the kind of Christianity I was brought up in the Baptist church, and I don't think it's uh, not consonant with most varieties. Uh, things like thinking critically, having a whole hell of a lot of fun, enjoying sex a whole bunch, taking certain substances, getting real drunk, letting you, yourself be a free spirit, being free of malice and the envy of other people and stuff aren't cultivated very by Christianity, all the things that, we, that, were, that Nietzsche associated with the other morality. Now, admittedly, the Greek way of, way of doing this is not is too straightforward, too childlike. Certainly not nearly as interesting as things will be later in his view or in mine either. Uh, now, Nietzsche makes here, and, and I'm going to read, a, I think, a famous passage, and a justly famous passage. Perhaps in this passage we see his most negative moment of the critique of Christianity. And so we'll look at that. And it's in, uh, and, and I'll read it briefly. And it's in the first essay of the Genealogy of Morals, in case you decide to read the book, in uh, section 15. And uh, I, I'll, I'll read, I haven't read to you much, so I, but this passage is so beautiful in Nietzsche, I can't, I can't pass it up. And moreover, I've talked about his style so much, and this is a great example of it. So I'll read you this, and then toward the end of the talk today, I'll, I'll, I'll do one other little piece. Okay. Nietzsche here is uh, discussing Christian values of love and faith, faith, love, and hope. And I'll start with his rhetorical question. What do I hear aright? They call things the last judgment. They call things their kingdom, the kingdom of the kingdom. God. Meanwhile, however, you know, until then, they live in faith in hope, in love. In faith in what? In love of what? In hope of what? Do you see how this genealogy of suspicion is going to start to work? Now he's going to examine that. In love of what? These weak people, someday or other, they too intend to be strong. There's no doubt in that. 
because someday their kingdom too shall come. They term it the kingdom of God, of course, because after all, one is so very humble in all things. To experience that, one needs to live a long time beyond death. Indeed, one needs eternal life so as to be eternally justified in the kingdom of God for this earthly life in faith, in love, in hope. But how justified? Dante, I think, committed a crude blunder. Very few people but Nietzsche would say Dante committed a crude blunder. Let me just tell you that right now. Dante, I think, committed a crude blunder when with a terror-inspiring ingenuity he placed above the gateway of his hell the inscription, I too was created by eternal love. At any rate, there would be more justification for placing above the gateway to the Christian paradise the inscription, I too was created by eternal hate, provided a truth may be placed above the gateway to a lie. For what is it that constitutes the bliss of the Christian paradise? We might even guess now a, Christian, now, a genealogist isn't going to guess. They're going to look for a text. We might guess, but Nietzsche says they have an authority to tell them about it. And, and Nietzsche doesn't pick out uh, Jimmy Swaggart or some second rate of Christianity. He picks a text from Thomas Aquinas. And, you know, arguably, I think Thomas Aquinas knew something about Christianity. That's my view. I don't think Nietzsche picked someone out of the mainstream of the tradition. I think he picked a very important figure. According to Thomas Aquinas, the chief blessing here in heaven will be like this. Thomas Aquinas, the great teacher and saint, says, The blessed in the kingdom of heaven will see the punishments of the damned in order that their bliss be more delightful to them. In place of the Greek athletes, we have martyrs. Surely you understand that this is drenched in more blood than the simple Greeks could ever dream of. I mean, the trick of genealogy is not to see that as an argument but to make it raise a whole host of suspicions in your mind about people who want to be nice, be good, be kind, love, cherish you. You've got to suspect that, that area of discourse. And this kind of genealogical argument, and I just gave you what I take to be a powerful sample of it, is supposed to make you ask this question. Isn't that kind of love a mask for a kind of hate? Isn't that kind of faith a mask of a kind of power? Now, don't think that because we call this a slave morality, it has no power. As Nietzsche once said, Christianity a mistake? A 2,000-year mistake? No. It does have power. I mean, it does have power. Don't, 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 see, don't think this is a shallow critique of Christianity. I mean, this is not denying its power, for God's sakes. It's appeal to love, appeal to love as a mask for hatred. And it's appeal to compassion as a mask for power. And in its deferred way of insisting upon having its own way. In fact, uh, now, now I will return to a simpler example that Nietzsche wouldn't have appreciated. But it's that after this, you should at least suspect when a television preacher, I don't want to be sued for libel here, but when a TV preacher goes, I love homosexuals. I'm trying to do the voice, too. But I hate their sin. After you've read Nietzsche's genealogy of morals, you may suspect that statement. You may just go, I suspect that's not the case. 
I mean, after all, uh, for a lot of people, being gay is what constitutes them as people in a certain way. It's part of their identity. You just don't go, well, I love them, but I hate that. It's kind of, I love Michael Jordan, but I don't like basketball. Well, there might be reasons for that. But it's hard to know what they'd be. I don't know it myself. In any case, this hermeneutic of suspicion that Nietzsche is drawing out is that Christianity, while presenting itself as a religion of love and compassion and tenderness, is a mask of hate and fear and another form of power. The Greek form of power was a form of power, too, that presented itself as an ideal of excellence. But it was, don't you see now that the, the metaphor more straightforward really applied? In other words, Odysseus would go, well, the Greek, it's like reading Aristotle, right? It's not a big secret to anyone that Aristotle's views represent the views of the gentlemanly upper classes of Greece. That shouldn't, it's no surprise because Aristotle says in the ethics that, well, I don't teach ethics to people who aren't well brought up young Greek men. I mean, why the hell bother because the rest are, you know, then you know who he's talking to. And that it has a charming honesty that one can find naively throughout Aristotle's encyclopedic intelligence. I mean, it's really charming. Uh, this, on the other hand, is a form of power that is subtle, important, very interesting. Now, the, the possibility, however, looms in this scheme that the triumph of these reactive forces will, as it were, overdo the job. You follow me? It's one thing to say no to certain instincts and life affirming or not, but it's quite another to push that process to the edge at which life is threatened in a profound and fundamental way. To deny them beyond a certain point begins to be a danger for the species. Now people keep going, well, you sound like some damn sociobiologist. Now the way Nietzsche is using these terms, life affirming, life negating, have to do with our fate as a species and being able to recreate ourselves. And in the writing of these myths, he's, of course, trying to recreate himself at some level, obviously. And retelling them is an effort at recreating something. I mean, God knows what it'll be by the time we're through, but it's an, it's an attempt to do that. Well, the two uh, things that he, saw, that he says, and, I, and again, keep that passage in mind, that, that characterize Christianity are resentment. And the term there means this double move of love-hate, this the resentment of the weak of the strong, but the resentment plays itself out for the strong as well in the form of guilt. So Nietzsche has an extended analysis of resentment and guilt as being fundamental to this, as it were, substructure of Christian discourse. Now, Nietzsche takes this whole argument to be very destructive of all ethical theories in the Western tradition for this obvious reason. Now, whether you're talking about Mill or about Kant, clearly these theories are rooted in that tradition. Especially Kant's, I mean, for God's sakes, it's, it's just a very high German theoretic account of the Golden Rule in a certain way. It's very complicated, but that's its essence, is that his parents were good pietists, and he, by God, is smart enough to justify being that, theoretically. And he is, by the way. In any case, these are the two, two uh, uh, factors Nietzsche uh, uh, sees working here in the reactive type, resentment and guilt. And the ideal for human living they posit, he says, is not an ascetic, not aesthetic, but ascetic ideal, namely the ideal of someone who just says no, an ascetic ideal. Not too much of anything. Oh, no, no more dessert for me. No, I'd rather not tonight. No, I can't do that now. What these are are mechanisms or ways of making our bad conscience, our guilt, bearable. This ascetic ideal, you know. It's an ideal so we can make these things bearable to, to live with. Now, I started uh, earlier on, I made the remark that we could only deal with so much reality. Well, on this topic here, again, we, we can only deal with so much of this critique till 
somebody wants to say, shut up. I, you know, I go to church, I don't want to hear any more of that. Shut your damn mouth, it's ruining it for me. I will in a minute, but not yet. Uh, what the ascetic ideal does is it makes this bearable, but it also expresses finally a will to nothingness, to just simply not have to will anymore. This is where the specter of nihilism arises. And it doesn't arise so much, it, well, it arises with the origin of Christianity. It does not become, as it were for Nietzsche, a problem on the agenda of the world and of our culture until what Nietzsche sees as the decadent period of Christianity. I, I mean, a, a, a period that I think we could understand might be, we might characterize this as a sort of decadent period in Christianity still lagging itself out. Uh, in this decadent period, what will happen is, uh, Nietzsche thinks, is that we will see an expression of the will to nothingness, simply the refusal to will to will anymore. Uh, this is where Nietzsche's worry, his fear, the, which I have named nihilism, which he names nihilism, has become a real cultural possibility. And uh, again, I'm going to refer to a film. I'm using films instead of referring to other texts because, as you know, in our culture, films are texts, right? And very important ones. A lot more people. A lot bigger impact on the objective culture. Let's face it. Take a movie like Heather's. Beautiful expression of the will to nothingness played out almost like an active will. In the movie Heather's, the young rebel wants the whole high school to commit suicide together and sign a mutual note about it and, call, and it'll be the Woodstock of the 90s. I like that. That's cute. That's in the spirit of Joy Division's famous line in one of their albums referring to Nietzsche. There's no turning back the last man. In other words, the last humans are already here. There's no turning back the next step. So today, for example, and now I will, in sympathy with some of my friends I know teaching theology, I should say, that their problem today, formulated in a, in a very high, at a high level, would be uh, not the disbeliever, which was the older problem you discussed in, in theology departments, not the non-believer, their problem today is the non-person. In other words, to find someone for whom belief or disbelief might mean any damn thing either way. It's not that you can't find people that won't go, oh, I believe, I believe, because you will. But to find someone that believes, you know, believes, like Kierkegaard believed or St. Paul believed, you know, really believes. So their problem isn't some finding some silly, tricky little argument but finding some human being somewhere to make it to. This is the nihilism that makes Nietzsche relevant to the current situation. What Nietzsche actually sees as the, as the end of this is that what, centered, what it centered around was God, and yet modern conditions, which I have characterized as the advent of capitalism, mass communication, what Max Weber said, were called what the disenchantment of the world. Disenchantment. I don't want to make that sound too strong because the enchanted world of the Middle Ages, you know, if you got a toothache in that enchanted world, it was unpleasant. So there are good things about modernity that I appreciate, like penicillin and other things. But so don't get too carried away with this enchanted, disenchanted distinction of Max Weber's. Nevertheless, though. Max Weber called this modern world disenchanted, and Nietzsche's trope for that, and this is the name of this lesson, is called, what, what a thing to call a lesson, the death of God. You know? This is one of Nietzsche's most notorious, as you know, parables, and uh, I'm going to use it and hope that I get a chance to interpret it to uh, bring to an end this sort of Nietzsche as a moralist, as a moralist uh, point. Uh, in any case, I want to, I want to, before I do that, I want to make two quick points about what I've just said. Both the Greek ideal, and, and don't think these are very limited ideals, they structure all the things we, we still value. 
to the extent that we're still human and still value things. Uh, the Greek ideal and then the Christian ideal from which our, our uh, other theories grew, say crucially important for all other theories, uh, as we, by the, I mean for all other ethical theories. Uh, for, one of the way Nietzsche sees these, and then I'll get onto this passage, is this way. Nietzsche talks about a reversal of values. That's from the master to the slave. Now, or from the active to the reactive human. That's the reversal. And the reversal, as I say, it has a double edge to it. It makes humans more mendacious, more interesting, sexier, more sinful. Interesting. One more example might help there. I mean, I, I, want, to, I want to make this point clear. Uh, Augustine's Confessions, I don't know how many of you have read this, but Augustine's Confessions are magnificent, and I think it's a wonderful book. Uh, Augustine feels more guilt and has more excitement over stealing a pair than any of us would feel if we stole seven million dollars. I mean, Augustine in the Confessions evokes sin in the most marvelously embodied way because he stole a stinking pair. We're a long way from that historically, folks. That is far distant. And now, my scary thing I'd like to say is I'm about to read this parable about the death of God. It's supposed to be shocking. And yet I feel like I'm at a time and a place in culture when we're far distant from our ability to be shocked by that at all either. What Nietzsche took to be most shocking, I think today is just grist for a certain commodity, system, certain way of advertising. In today, world spirit may very well be just advertising. Nevertheless, let me... Uh, give you the famous parable, Nietzsche's Death of God parable, and, uh, and I'll use it to bring this kind of suspicion to an end, because with the death of God we have, uh, in Nietzsche, and, and I, I, it's going to take a long time to explain it, I'll do that in the next lecture, we'll talk more about this parable, we could have spent eight hours interpreting just the parable. First of all, the, a parable called the death of God can't be atheism, right? Because to, to, the, to the bourgeois atheist, it makes no sense to say God died because there wasn't one, so he couldn't have died. So that doesn't make sense. The death of God is about the drying up of a horizon of meaning and of a whole form of human life and about Nietzsche's both fear and exhilaration at what might come next. And we still, to a large extent, live in the interregnum between so between worlds, if you will, or between paradigms. Not many people in the history of the world have faced that, lived in periods like that. So Nietzsche, in that sense, is also a prophetic thinker. So I'll share with you, you know, just so you can scandalize your friends, hell if nothing else, Nietzsche's famous uh, parable, and uh, it's from the gay science. Uh, the one I want to share with you is the parable from the gay science called the madman, naturally. And as a madman myself, sometimes a professional madman, I enjoy this passage a lot. The gay science, uh, this is uh, 125, Afroism 125. And of course, these are the, the, some of Nietzsche's fragments he's best known for because they're filled with hyperbole and wonderful invective. And, and uh, so this one, I, I enjoy this one. The madman. Have you not heard of that madman who lit a lantern in the bright morning hours and ran to the marketplace. Please follow Nietzsche's every line because none of this is accidental. The madman lit a lantern and ran to the marketplace okay, and cried incessantly, I seek God, I seek God. Well, you can imagine that in a mall, right? The cops are going to come and pull you out because nothing in a mall is that serious. It's not designed to be, folks. Anyway, as many of those who do not believe in God were standing around, just, see, you all thought Nietzsche was not just a simple atheist. But now, let's follow this. Uh, as many of those who did not believe in God were standing around just then, he provoked much laughter. Maul again, right? Oh, God, get the scalp out of that here. Uh, did he get lost, one said? Did he lose his way like a child, said another? Or is he hiding? Now they're talking about him. Or is he hiding? 
Is he afraid of us? Has he gone on a voyage? Has he immigrated? They yelled and laughed. The madman jumped into their midst and pierced them with his glance. Whether it's God, he cried, I shall tell you. We have killed him. You and I. All of us are his murderers. But how have we done this thing? How were we able to drink up the sea? Who gave us the sponge to wipe away the entire horizon? What did we do when we unchained the earth from its center, from its sun? Whether is it moving now? Away from all suns? Or are we not plunging continually, backward, forward, sliding in all directions? Do we not hear anything yet of the noise of the grave diggers who are burying God? Even so close to them, I'm, I'm adding the text now, even as close to some of those grave diggers as we all sit today, don't we hear them, they're digging at all? Is not night and more night coming on all the time? Do we not smell anything yet of God's decomposition? God's too decomposed. God is dead. God remains dead, and we've killed him. Now, there's a change, okay? Now, the mall people are a little quiet now, because this is more interesting than they thought it would be, okay? Now, quiet now. And, God, and now, now he goes on, and here's the part I want to introduce my next series of talks with. How shall we, the murderers of all murderers, comfort ourselves now? What was holiest that the world has yet known has bled to death under our knives, and who can wipe the blood off of us? What water is there that can clean us now? What festivals of atonement, what sacred games shall we have to invent? What new myths, what new ways to live shall we have to invent? Is not the greatness of our deed still far too great for us. Must not we ourselves become God simply to be worthy of it? Here the madman fell silent and looked again at the listeners, and they were silent and astonished. At last he threw his lantern on the ground, and it broke and went out. I come too early. My time has not yet come, said the madman. This tremendous event is still on its way still wandering. It has not yet reached the ears of man. Lightning and thunder require time, and the light of the stars requires even more time. Deeds, too, require time, even after they are done, before they can be seen and heard by many. This deed is still more distant from some of them than the most distant star, and yet they have done it themselves. It has been related, Father, Nietzsche again, it has been related, Father, that on that same day the madman entered various churches, and there he sang his requiem to a dead God, led out and called to account. He is said to have replied each time, what are these churches now, if not the sepulchres and the tombs of God? What are these churches now, if not the sepulchres and the tombs of God? Well, there's the famous death of God parable for what it's worth or not worth. It takes a lot of interpreting, but it's a very, very, for me, a very exciting and interesting challenging, powerful, and serious moment. I mean, philosophers are very seldom ever really serious. You can tell that from Socrates. And, and sometimes the best part about them is they're not too serious. But that's a very serious uh, moment for, uh, for Nietzsche. Uh, and it's also a moment that I think that I'd like to bring down to earth just a bit. Because this is still a deed quite distant from us, and it may take quite a bit of work to pull it closer. 
But it's really hard not to catch a sense for that. Uh, coming from the university I come from, where we have one of the world's great cathedrals, Duke Chapel, and we have a beautiful stained glass painting of various saints, martyrs, apostles, and Christ. But most important, and I want to return to Nietzsche's first line about the marketplace. Our madman went to the marketplace to tell the news because it's in the marketplace where the news in the new era of the world, in the new world order, it's the marketplace where the news needed to be spread. Okay? In any case, in Duke Chapel, it's a beautiful chapel, and I mean it's the best imitation you can get this side of Europe. Built in the 30s, I think, 20s, 30s, right? 20s, 30s, something like that. In this chapel, you wander through, and for a moment, your sense of reverence is almost there. You almost can remember some of those feelings when you were very young and you thought just maybe there was, that was right or whatever. But you wander off the edge of the chapel and usually it's very cool in there and they're playing Bach and it's just a nice place to go. Yeah, to meditate. But as you wander off, then there are the barons of tobacco and all of the barons of tobacco, the Washington Duke family, all buried in state. Not cardinals, not saints, not martyrs, no Thomas Aquinas, no St. Thomas More, but George Washington Duke and his family, the buyers and sellers of America's first international commodity, tobacco. The fortune upon which that church is erected and to which it is dedicated. What is that magnificent church now but the tomb and the sepulcher of God? This seems, has always seemed to me a striking example from a local perspective. I mean, you need to visit the chapel if you come to Duke, and you're welcome to do so. Uh, I will bring up a few things from the genealogy again. But by the time we've reached this moment of the death of God, we already have a strange change in the discourse of Nietzsche's text. Because now the challenge will be for me to present what I have only so far indicated. And, I, and it's indicated in the parable. What new games, new festivals can human beings, insofar as there is any life that remains, what could be invented now? to make up for what has already been destroyed. And that's the challenge we'll have in the next classes, is to see, first, what does Nietzsche offer us by way of any new myth like that? And more importantly, what myths could we construct ourselves? What games? What holy festivals? What interesting books? Fascinating arguments and new ways to live other than the pathetic, tragic, stupid, Final array of ordinary, everyday, bourgeois, stinking life. Surely we can do better than that. Surely. So that's the uh, project that we will head out on. You know? Because we don't want to end with a thought that always seems to me ghastly, and especially after reading Nietzsche, is that to imagine someone looking at your tombstone. Years from now, it says Bill Riley you know, gives the dates. It's always comforting to me. Visit no. graveyards. I like it. It's sold tires. <laughs> now I don't know if, if any of you sell tires, and I know people are driven to that at worst. But still, that that would be a great salesman, wonderful friend, nice chum. To experience that horror, just that horror, may require some effort from us, but I want us to experience it so that we might think of some new games, some new ways to live.